Reading the news. News today comes in all different shapes and sizes and angles. And as technology continues to advance at lightning speed, so too does the nature of news, how it is compiled, disseminated, and ultimately understood. Coupled with decreasing public trust in journalism, embodied by terms such as fake news and alternative facts, the role of media as the traditional gatekeepers of democracy is in jeopardy. For example, a recent Pew Research Center study found that most Americans are more concerned with made-up news than they are with issues like racism and terrorism. The journalist's job has been further imperiled by growing attacks by heads of state across the globe, which has seemingly paralleled a surge in populism and an intensification of political partisanship. The history of the news business traces back millennia, but really took off with the advent of the printing press in the 16th century, allowing information to be exchanged by all and not just by the elite. This eventually led to the creation of the first newspapers as we would recognize them beginning in the Orient, Europe, and ultimately the United States. James Franklin was jailed for criticizing the colonial government for failing to protect citizens from pirates. He turned his paper over to his brother after being forbidden to publish anything without permission of the government. His brother was Benjamin Franklin. This might be viewed as one of the first steps in defining personal liberty, which is intrinsically connected to freedom of the press, perhaps the most fundamental cornerstone of the United States Constitution. The journalist's purpose is to deliver the facts and not manipulate them to any end to put truth to paper. This requires independence, balance, fairness, namely the non-adherence to editorial lines or personal or institutional biases and accountability. How does a reporter build a complete and objective news story? The five W's, who, what, when, where, why, and how. These are the core elements of a news story. A story must begin with a lead. It's the most important element, the first paragraph of any news story. It provides the basis of the story and holds the reader's interest. All facts need to be confirmed by at least two reliable sources. Developments must be explained from the outset, those involved identified, the source of the content made explicit, and increasingly lost art, mind you. And then context, context, context. Always include relevant background information and all sides of the story. Equally important is differentiating between different forms of articles. Headlines, get right to the point in short, concise sentences. Hard news, the five W's rule the day. Features, will they leave room for a bit more creativity and in-depth reporting, but should still be rooted in actuality. Finally, opinion or editorial pieces which present a certain point of view and should never be conflated with fact. Fact-checking, a crucial component of any story, is often the difference between fact-based and fake news. The Fixer is the journalist's guide to foreign locales and someone the journalist relies on as his eyes and ears, and often for matters of security. Absent these elements, the result is the erosion of journalistic standards, the root cause of public mistrust. If a reader is presented with fact as opinion or vice versa, then it is nearly impossible for them to interpret an event from a point of reference that allows rational and non-conforming conclusions to be drawn. This has become even more difficult in the information age, in which news is often created in 280 characters and shared throughout the world at a touch of a button. In June 2019, breaking news of Tunisian President Baji Sayyid Sebsi's hospitalization quickly mushroomed into premature reports of his death. An Nahar TV, an Arabic language satellite television channel broadcasting from Algeria, was one of several Arab news outlets who mistakenly reported the death of the Tunisian president. Saudi-based media giant Al Arabiya News Channel apologized for spreading rumors of Sebsi's death. In August 2006, during the war between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Reuters news agency published a photograph by correspondent Adnan Hatch, 
purporting to show Beirut following Israeli airstrikes. A blogger picked up on an oddity in the photo. Some of the smoke seemed to have been copied and pasted into the photo, apparently in order to make it seem more intense. Hajj denied altering the image, but Reuters immediately removed all of his photos in its archive and eventually fired him. Hajj had also altered a photo of an Israeli fighter jet dropping a defensive flare in the skies over Lebanon by multiplying the flares and giving the impression of forward motion. Indeed, a caption soon emerged saying the jet was firing missiles. In 2002, the Palestinian Authority accused Israel of spreading fake news about Al-Qaeda. The PA claimed that the Israeli spy agency Mossad planted a fake Al-Qaeda terrorist cell in Gaza. The Palestinians said the reason behind it was to justify attacks in Palestinian areas. The accusations also came from American media outlets. The Washington Post newspaper said United States officials believe the website speaks for Al-Qaeda and that it was being monitored by U.S. intelligence agencies. But there is one catch here. The news of Al-Qaeda group presence in Gaza was based on a statement from the website Mujahideen.net, which has close ties to Al-Qaeda. The news was never substantiated. Whether Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter, social media platforms are a double-edged sword. They empower individuals to expose, unite, and in some cases, form movements that have toppled authoritarian governments and even entire nations. But these platforms have also become vehicles to spread false information, sometimes by actors seeking to undermine democracy and the rule of law. Meanwhile, professional journalists can all too easily succumb to the temptation to get it first as opposed to get it right. In a remarkable instance, Pope Francis admonished to be careful in choice of words, resist publishing fake news, and urge journalists to remain humble. How is a news story composed? News begins where it occurs, it needs to be followed in trusted multimedia formats, and remember, social media is only a tool. Hi Felice, hi attendees, hope you're all enjoying the event. I'm Charles Bublazer, Managing Editor of the Media Line, and my goal today is to explain to you in a few brief moments how to compose an article. There are different types of articles, obviously, and the most common form is hard news. So we've chosen a particular article written by our Arab Affairs correspondent, Dima Abu Maria. So you see that the headline is somewhat provocative, but certainly not clickbait, and basically gives you an idea of what the story is about. Most essential is that in the lead, which is the first paragraph, it's a journalistic term, the information, the core information must be accessible to the reader. So, as you'll see, unable to obtain the usual congressional approval, Congress involved, U.S. President Donald Trump, White House involved, has invoked emergency authority in order to essentially override lawmakers and approve arms sales to somewhat controversial countries. Besides getting the facts right, the most important part of a news article, and it is a little bit of a dying breed, is to get sources. The media line adheres to the highest standards in terms of journalism ethics when it comes to them, with all of our articles, including at least two sources and sometimes up to three, four, or five. That's the key, to find balance. And at the end, one writes a brief conclusion summarizing the entire issue. For her analysis piece, we've chosen one written by Mohammed al Qasim, our bureau chief, in the immediate aftermath of former Egyptian president Mohammed Morsi's recent death. In this type of piece, the journalist is given a little bit more leeway. Uh, as you can see, for example, in the lead, only the most critical element of the particular story might be included. Immediately, you'll see that the main point is always included in the lead, although there's a lot more room for flexibility. As well, you'll see that only a few paragraphs down, we bring in context, and the analysis piece allows for this. So, for example, it discusses how Mohammed Morsi rose to power following the Arab Spring Revolution in Egypt in 2011, and a little bit about how the Muslim Brotherhood, which has become a controversial organization, was founded and expanded. But 
Again, it must be sourced uh, in a balanced way with both proponents of the Brotherhood and opponents of the Brotherhood. In terms of features, we chose one by Tara Cavalier, who works with the Media Line as well. And when it comes to this type of piece, they're generally pitched to editors, and they're very specific in nature for the most part. Often, they cover off-the-beaten-track stories, focus on a particular issue, and can even be an in-depth look into a conflict. In this particular one, we've combined our focus, the Middle East and Arab world, with veganism, a major trend in the United States that's obviously gaining momentum throughout the world. This type of piece is generally a couple of thousand words long, includes multiple sources, as well as background information. Also, one of the most important elements of this is to give the reader a feel of the issue that you're covering. So there's also room for a little bit of color. And finally, there's field reporting. Most likely a journalist's favorite thing to do. Felice and I recently attended an event in Jerusalem titled Journalism Under Siege. Covering events like this provides the journalists with access to some people that otherwise wouldn't be made available, such as experts that are speaking or giving panels at the particular conference. Perhaps more importantly is bringing to life what's happening there and then. So this might include giving a first-hand perspective on the undertakings, as well as speaking to audience members, painting an atmosphere, and overall, the key responsibility of a journalist is to convey fact-based information to a reader in an accessible form that allows him or her, you in fact, to draw conclusions for yourselves. Understanding media bias. Therefore, be honest about issues related to funding and potential conflict of interests and no more hidden agendas. At a more micro level, differentiate between pundit and journalist. The former offers subjective opinions the latter gets to the core of the same issue, irrespective of whether their personal views dovetail with the details. How do we protect journalism and why? Don't lower the bar or cut corners with journalism's core principles. Our attention spans have created the two to three minute time tag stamped on stories offered by news sites. Read the rest of the story. Move out of your comfort zone and read sources you don't believe in. We need to incorporate journalism's basic tenets in school curricula. The Media Lines Press and Policy Student Program mentors students who earn academic credit from more than a dozen participating colleges and universities. And on a professional level, create a journalistic umbrella with a diverse team of organizations and individuals coming together to take back journalism.